So instead of sitting on the sidelines or instead of occasionally playing the game, not only play, but play it hard how you want to play it. So welcome to today's episode for the TRT and Hormone Optimization Channel. Uh, it's just me and Kyle today. So as usual, uh, you might be used to seeing Stephen. He's not here. Uh, so it's just going to be us today. So I'm really excited to have Kyle Gillett on today. We've been uh, going back and forth uh, off and on for probably a little bit over a year from my memory on Instagram, uh, particularly talking about the topics that I'm, I'm really excited to get into today, which is the stuff that I think is extremely important to discuss around the topic of testosterone replacement therapy. And it's all the things that often get overlooked uh, and often get skipped out. So Kyle, uh, thank you for joining me today. Welcome to the, uh, the welcome back to the channel, apologies. And uh, how have you been going? What's been, what's been new for you? And then we'll uh, we'll kick off. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Um, on the day that we filmed this, I had my episode with Nick Bear come out, so um, it was particularly fun to film that one. I think that uh, on that podcast we discussed a lot of similar topics, and one of those was the concept of dialing in testosterone, whether it's natural or whether it is exogenous. So I'm excited to talk about those things today. Fantastic. It, it was really good to listen to. I think it was the first podcast that you did with Andrew Huberman, where you, you talked about some really good topics. I mean, both pod, pod, podcasts were great, but the one that I'm referring to was the first podcast. And you made a couple of comments around the importance of movement practices. You made some really important comments on what I thought was fascinating regarding your relationship or your you relating, sorry, the concept of Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, to what you call the pillars of health. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs was something that came up a lot for me doing marketing. It's a lot of the time a business term that we look at in terms of when we're looking to market a product or market a service, how it fits into that individual's hierarchy of needs in terms of where it will fall into in, in a budget. But to hear you relating it to your pillars of health was very interesting for me to have this approach and this rationale behind I guess what I see is a lot of guys kind of skipping over what I think and, and what I'm sure you will agree are the lowest hanging fruit in an effort to maybe try to find and maybe unknowingly try to find the path of least resistance, potentially looking for a shortcut, potentially looking for an easier solution. So I recently spoke at uh, my friend Ali Gilbert's Silverback Conference uh, around this topic of what I call guys who are trying to out TRT uh, their lifestyle and health issues. So I'd like to start off today just to, to, I guess, kick off the conversation. What do you think are the lowest hanging fruits that guys get wrong on or off TRT that is jeopardizing their health outcomes in relation to all topics to do with testosterone? Yeah, from a thousand foot view, what people often miss is the general preventive maintenance. And it's often the things that don't show up for decades. Some examples of this, um, and this is not a great example because people are starting to look for this more, is sleep apnea. They start TRT, their sleep apnea gets worse, and perhaps they it takes years, if not a decade, until they finally say, you know what, I still feel so abnormal on TRT that I'm finally going to go ahead and address the sleep apnea. Um, and there's many ways to address it other than with a CPAP, as um, many people know. But there's other things like, um, you know, let's say they're um, building up insulin resistance over time. And even though their, uh, body fat percentage might not look too terrible, maybe they weigh 280 pounds and they still have, you know, uh, 70 pounds of body fat and they are not particularly metabolically healthy. So perhaps something like a CGM would be better in that case. There's lots of cases like that, but, um, you can't out TRT the most common causes of low testosterone, which are still metabolic syndrome and sleep apnea. I heard a, uh, a, I think it was a reel or a short. Anyway, it was something and it was an interview. I don't, can't remember what podcast it was, but there was an individual and he said, get ready for a master class on testosterone optimization. So that I pricked up my ears and uh, he did not mention metabolic syndrome. He did not mention sleep apnea or sleep in general. He talked about endocrine disruptors like xenoestrogens, and he talked about, um, um, what else did he talk about? He basically talked about several things that were not the most common causes, 
And I love to talk about rare causes of uh, endocrine disruption, but uh, you got to get your basics first before you turbocharge your car or put nitrous on it. You got to do the general preventive maintenance. I'm so glad that you brought up cars. Uh, I always bring up cars in my analogies, and even though I don't understand cars that well, I think that cars are often a really good analogy for understanding the interconnected systems of systems of human health. And I often like to come back to the movie Cars. Uh, and if anyone hasn't seen the movie Cars, it's definitely worth a watch. But in this movie, it's basically, you know, it doesn't spoil anything, of course. It's the premise of the movie. The cars are alive. The cars are these sentient beings. And I think that that explains humans quite well in terms of we are a series of interconnected systems like the mechanics of a car, but we are also experiencing consciousness and life as that vehicle itself. And sometimes I think there's a lot of separation and distinction between the driver and the vehicle, whereas I think that the relationship is a lot closer than people think. And it's great that you brought up this idea of the metabolism in terms of the energy supply, like the fuel. You know, if, if there's a problem with the fuel line if, or if you put really poor quality fuel into the car, it's absolutely going to break down over time. And then if it's not rested and looked after properly, it's also going to run into issues. And one thing that I found that has been not something that I would say was like a huge shock and um, something that blew me away, but it was definitely something where if you'd asked me a few years prior, I wouldn't have understood the significance until I'd observed it at scale, is how important it is to be lean, to be in good health. You know, I came more from a neuropsychiatric background in terms of getting into hormones. I was always into training and being fit, but if, if, if someone had told me that the difference between being, let's say, between 15 and 20% body fat versus, versus being between 10 and 15% body fat would make a massive difference in your overall metabolic and physical and psychological health, I wouldn't have put the significance on that beyond how you felt about how you looked in the mirror. But one of the most important things relating to what you're talking about with metabolic syndrome is this idea that when you do have excess body fat, when you do have insulin resistance, the fuel simply doesn't work properly in the car, and this creates a very stressed environment. So I think it's, you know, for guys who are listening to this in terms of your take-homes, understand that if you're having issues with your metabolism in terms of body fat, your diet, and your sleep, it's going to be very difficult for you to feel the way that you want to feel and perform the way that you want to perform. And while there may be biohacks and there may be shortcuts around that, they're definitely not going to be things that are going to uh, cancel that out. So give us a, i've noticed that on quite a few podcasts lately you've been talking about your six pillars of health um and what i'd love to do is for you to kind of outline each of these pillars and then we can maybe go back and forth with some, some discussion points around each pillar so if you'd like please just run us through what you think these six pillars of health are or how you've defined them and maybe also if you could talk about this this hierarchy or maslow's hierarchy of needs and how they relate to those pillars Certainly, the first two pillars are diet and exercise, to no surprise. And with these, the optimal regimen is individualized. You think of a, um, two individuals and they're at the same body composition, and um, one of them develops diabetes very easily, and one of them seemingly has insulin resistant, but no diabetes. Perhaps they even have an A1C uh, 5.6 or under, um, let alone uh, 6.4, for a long period of time. Diet and exercise is kind of similar. Um, you have a lot of factors that go into what is the best regimen, but the number one factor is adherence. So if the if two individuals that, uh, let's take, they're identical twins, and via nurture, they've developed different preferences. Um, you can change your preferences, but only to some degree. Uh, so it's a neuroplasticity is on a continuum. And you're going to be able to um, find the ideal regimen for both of them. That being said, if they're identical twins, the optimal diet and exercise regimen is probably going to be pretty darn similar. So those are the first two. They're the most important. After that is sleep, which we've already briefly discussed earlier. And then after that, I, I used alliteration for S's. So sunlight includes heat and cold exposure. Just being outdoors, humans, of course, as organic machines are, uh, you know, that's where they function is outdoors. We also function indoors to some degree, but uh, there's been a lot of natural selection to where we um, 
have adapted to function outdoors. And perhaps now we're kind of adapting to function in indoors, but with the help of pharmacology. So that's kind of an interesting topic maybe for a future day. So that's uh, sleep and then sunlight. Stress is the next one. So you want effort to feel good, whether it's lifting a weight or doing something stressful, like running after your toddler. And then after that is uh, social health. It's actually technically a seventh pillar. Rich Roll convinced me to add this one. I think the last couple of years have been very indicative that social health is extremely important. Um, and then after that is uh, spiritual health. So that's where Maslow's hierarchy of needs comes in. It's the self-actualization at the top of the pyramid. Yes, there is certainly critique to Maslow's hierarchy. And some of that critique has to do with um, how a lot of times you have to meet certain needs at the same time, specifically physical needs and uh, mental health needs. So um, I understand that critique. But at the end of the day, it always depends. You can critique anything and um, both of us could play devil's advocate if we asked any questions. So I think that um, just having that uh, pyramid and then looking at self-actualization on top, that's just the best way that I can explain why there is needs past physical needs and mental needs. It's basically your purpose in life or um, what you're trying to achieve. Even if you are a nihilist, your purpose is that you are a nihilist and you kind of identify with that. Um, perhaps that leads back to tribalism or perhaps that leads back to like the um, chaos of the universe. A lot of nihilists believe in like uh, universe chaos and that's sort of a deity in and of itself. But anyway, the point is uh, not to rabbit trail too much. Um, just having some sort of purpose is uh, much better than nothing. There, there is so much good stuff to unpack there, and it, it's so great to hear you talk about this. It's, it's very, it's. It, I wouldn't say it's, it's the same, but it, it's a very similar discourse to what Paul Check talks about in his uh, Check Academy, which is he talks about he has four, and he calls them the four doctors, and he basically says that as long as you engage with these four doctors, which are not physical beings, they're practices that you do, like you know, doctor diet and doctor quiet and doctor movement. Um, basically saying that as long as you engage and have a relationship with these aspects of human health, then you will never actually need to go and see a real doctor or real doctor, as what he would say. Um, so I'd like to go through those all one by one. And, and I think the, the really key takeaway from here is that in none of those points, other than potentially the pharmacology integrating into uh, this very fast adaption that we've had from being outdoors to being indoors, there was no mention of pharmaceutical protocols, there was no mention of uh, injection protocols for TRT. You know, these are things which I think if we look at, and, and for those who haven't looked at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs before, if this is a foreign concept, it's often de uh, depicted kind of like a, a pyramid, kind of like the food pyramid in terms of like the ones down the bottom are wider and then they allow for the, the next ones to be built on top. So we have this hierarchy in terms of being like the, you know, the, the social and the spiritual, for example, that Kyle talked about, they can only come when the foundations underneath are already in place. So I'd like to start with, with the first point. You made a really good point that I, I've actually found myself talking about quite a bit is what I see a lot happen in groups. And I really understand why people do this because people are trying to troubleshoot their problems. And I think that it's fantastic that we have groups and communities that are built around people who've come together to troubleshoot their problems. But unless someone is your identical twin, your personal protocol for your TRT, your diet, your blood work, and your movement, it, it can often be more, what I've seen, it, it can actually do more harm than good to try to deduce meaning from comparing your protocol or your blood work or your values to someone else. Unless they are your identical twin, there are far too many variables in terms of our genetics and then you know what Carl talked about with this nature versus nurture topic. So when it comes to those areas, when, when guys are, are troubleshooting with their situation, if they're going, okay, I don't know where to start with, with my diet. I don't know where to start with you know, my movement principles. I, I often have to remind myself that sometimes there, there are people out there and it's not a dig at people. It's just understanding that we're all at a different place in the world. Some people are not versed on what macronutrients are. Some people are not versed on the importance of you know, protein, for example, or the importance of micronutrient food. So you, you, had a, you had a term, and I wrote it down, but I don't have my paper with me, but you had this great term that was kind of like a little saying 
around finding a movement practice that you can do for life. So what would be your basic recommendations for someone who's going, okay, this sounds really good, but I wouldn't have a clue where to start. Regarding movement practices to last a lifetime, that just goes back to adherence. So if you have two different people and let's say one of them really likes resistance training and hates doing uh, aerobic exercise and then the other person vice versa, um, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean the one person should just do resistance training and the one person should just do cardio, perhaps really easy cardio. Maybe they only like to do low intensity, steady state at zone one or zone two. They should teach themselves to like some aspect of both types of exercise, but uh, it is perfectly okay to skew one way heavily and then uh, also skew the other way heavily. And those two individuals can both have optimal health. The law of diminishing returns applies, um, especially when it comes to exercise. So if you have two different people and one of them, like let's say they do resistance training five days a week for a full year and the other, and then for nine years does nothing. And the other person does resistance training one day a week, but for nine years in a row, you're going to see much better results um, health wise and probably aesthetic wise as well for the individual doing full body resistance training just one day a week, even though that's obviously not optimal. Yeah, I, I think the what you mentioned with adherence is really important because we can give someone the best diet and nutrition program possible or the best exercise program possible, but it doesn't matter if they're not going to do it. Um, and I often say to people, you know, the form of exercise that you're going to do to start with is the best form of exercise. And what you mentioned, I, I think, in, in Huberman's podcast was this idea, and maybe it was just what I extrapolated from it, but you've got to find something that you will actually do for a lifetime. And, that, and that's a practice that you can build and you can cultivate and you can you know get further into as you go and i think that people try different exercise modalities you know you dip your toes in a bit of martial arts maybe a bit of crossfit maybe a bit of endurance work bodybuilding strength training you know whatever whatever floats your boat so you can find something that you go yeah maybe it's all a little bit hard or maybe it's all challenging but this is something that i guess ticks a bigger box for me so was the next pillar beyond this, was it the stress one or was it sunlight and, and, and uh, temperature? Yeah, after diet and exercise, all of the alliteration pillars are on equal levels. So usually I talk about sleep next. And with sleep, there is a lot of ways to improve your, improve your sleep other than just making sure you don't have sleep apnea. And it is certainly possible to have hypoxia at night, even if you don't have true obstructive sleep apnea, things like Pickwickian syndrome, which a lot of um, individuals with very large chests will develop. And then there's also um, basically sleep disorders where you wake up and you have that hyper sympathetic high fight or flight response, and that can disrupt sleep. Um, there's also other things that you should track for sleep, especially if you're at risk of things like Parkinson's disease before developing Parkinson's. Almost everyone before that happens has uh, basically movement disorder during sleep via disordered REM sleep. So the REM sleep is a rapid eye movement sleep where you're, you're usually dreaming, your eyes are moving, but the rest of your body is paralyzed, where those two things can become discongruent, where your body can not be completely paralyzed. So it's kind of the opposite of sleep paralysis. Your legs are moving around, you start sleepwalking again. That'd be a red flag to look at um, early Parkinsonian symptoms or early symptoms of Lewy body dementia. So sleep is of particular importance. Um, I know there's a lot of podcasters like Matt Walker that essentially just talk about sleep. But kind of similar to diet and exercise, people require different amounts of sleep. So one person might be sleeping seven hours and one person might be sleeping eight and a half hours. And that can be optimal and healthy for both individuals, especially if they have different goals. Awesome. So a couple of questions just to go off here, because I think these are the questions that people would have when they listen to this. So one thing that comes up for me all the time with my clients is people going, well, one, how do I know I'm getting enough sleep? And I think that that can be a tricky one to answer. You know, we hear, you know, type A, you know, fitness influencers, lifestyle influencers who are getting like, you know, five, six hours of sleep a night and saying that they're killing it and everything's going really well. Um, and then you've also got guys who are 
you know, maybe finding that they're sleeping eight, nine hours a night and maybe they're oversleeping and they're waking up and still feeling tired and fatigued. What advice would you have for someone who's wondering, am I getting enough sleep in terms of, are there any metrics that they could be looking at in terms of outside of something like an aura ring in terms of like how they're feeling or how they're waking up? And two, without getting too much into like the, um, the biohacking things in terms of being like, I think people know, you know, less caffeine in the afternoon, less green exposure, doing some form of wind down activities, blacked out, cool room. I know having the room nice and cool works really well for me. What tips would you have for, for people that would be the lowest hanging fruits that they could do if they're like, look, my sleep does need some work? Actually, home sleep studies of uh, varying degrees of accuracy and precision, but they're uh, even better than the newest generation Aura or Whoop or um, basically other biometric data tracking on uh, that are on the market right now. And they can be ordered through a website. So sometimes I send people to, there's a lot of di different companies that order home sleep studies. That way they don't have to go in or they don't have to fly to a big city. They just get their sleep study shipped out to their house and they take it. Even if it's cash pay, no insurance, it's usually about $300. And that is a great baseline. Think of uh, People are familiar with the concept of your baseline labs that you use for the rest of your life, where you're just basically checking everything. Um, and think of that as baseline for sleep if you have any inclination of a sleep disorder. That's a really good takeaway because I am very, very far from a sleep specialist. And I was under the impression, which I would say a lot of people are, is that unless you go into a sleep lab and get hooked up to a bunch of gizmos, which make it impossible to sleep properly anyway, I thought that the home sleep studies were of very poor quality and, and were, were you know, functionally useless. So I think that's fantastic for people who you know maybe don't like using, like I personally, I, I love getting the data from clients from things like Garmin's, Aura's, Whoop's, et cetera, but I don't like them myself. Um, so knowing that guys can go, okay, as a oneself, we can get a sleep study done, which is gonna give us more diagnostic and comprehensive data in the comfort of our own home because i can imagine if i went and did one of those sleep studies at a, at a hospital i wouldn't sleep properly anyway um, and it would be useless so that's a really good takeaway so people can just go online and they can order them at home and then the data that they get from that is that something that they would be able to is it presented in a, in a way you know that is interpretable by the patient to look at or is that something that they're going to go okay take it to a practitioner and then get some recommendations on what to do and before we go into that i'd also add, like to add a second question on sleep one thing that I'm a fan of for me personally, for those who hear me talk, I have very narrow sinuses. Um, I got smashed in the nose a couple of times, which didn't help. And one thing that really helps me is it's called a mute snoring device, which are like these little rings that go upside in your nose to hold your nostrils open. Kind of like a, the breathing tape that uh, Alex Hormozzi wears, but on the inside. Do you think that things like that or like a vital sleep mouth guard, for example, is something that could replace or maybe not replace a CPAP, but be something that people could look to before going down the CPAP line? In some cases, yes. In regard to the question about the home sleep study or going to these uh, essentially telemedicine clinics, it usually involves uh, getting a consult. That way a physician or a nurse practitioner will interpret them. I know my um, podcast co-host, James O'Hara, does a lot with sleep studies and he has a lot of info on them. And I consider him an expert when it comes to the validity of home sleep, sleep studies and things like that. When it comes to aura rings, whoops, biometric data tracking, Dr. Taylor Martin, another one of my colleagues, um, he has some great info on that. And then, um, and his Instagram is Taylor Martin D O M P H. Eric Colrim is also a PhD that is very knowledgeable when it comes to the latest and greatest because every generation it gets better and better not just for whoops and auras and garments but also for home sleep studies so the technology is growing across the board not just in the direct to consumer um, technology aspect i suppose but um yeah i guess the two-tiered part of that question was how to know if things like a tap oral appliance that's like uh, kind of like a mouth guard that usually a dentist or an orthodontist makes uh, my brother's a dentist, as some people know, and uh, one of our best friends is an orthodontist, and they're very knowledgeable about those things. I am not very knowledgeable, but I know enough from talking to them. And I, um, 
James has also done a podcast with my brother um, regarding the oral appliances. So check out the Gillette Health podcast. I guess that's an easy plug. Um, but uh, basically, it it's not it's uncommon enough to where it's usually not worth trying for the average individual unless you know where the rate limiting step is. So if the rate limiting step for your sleep quality, it sounds like you know it's very likely in uh, the nasal cavity or the sinuses, then you can kind of target that area. If you think it's the back of the throat, then a lot of times I refer to an otolaryngologist. And then um, if it is something like a tongue or soft tissue, a dentist or an orthodontist can help. I think that's a, it's a really good point. And, and it's something that I bring up with my clients a lot is that if there are sleep issues and, and you know, let's say your partner's like, look, you know, you're snoring your head off. It's very obvious that there's a sleep problem. It's often very important to go, okay, let's get this diagnosed in terms of understanding what the root cause is, especially if it's something like me and I can go, my sinus is widened. So doing this in the interim will be much more comfortable and more effective than getting a, um, you know, a CPAP in the interim. Um, but I think that's a really good takeaway for people is that if, you're, if your sleep quality is compromised, it's important to look to see if you can diagnose what that cause is rather than just going, okay, need to be looking at a CPAP. Consider becoming a channel member for exclusive features like loyalty badges, early access to new videos, funny stuff like rough cuts and bloopers, members only photos and status updates on the community tab, and members only live stream chat. On desktop, use the join button next to the subscribe. On mobile, use the join link in the description. So the next one that I'd like to talk to you about is what you mentioned under, I mean, the alliteration on sunlight, but this idea of sunlight, temperature, and I guess exposure to nature. And one thing that's been very interesting for me, I mean, I grew up in Australia for the majority of my life and just moved to Eastern Europe. And as someone who had maybe spent two weeks in snow for their entire 30 year life and then spent about seven months in snow, uh, that was very interesting to go from, you know, four hours of light, you know, deep minus temperatures all day and all night. Um, one thing that worked very well for me was just the, you know, very simple, take some extra vitamin D. And that was something which I guess I didn't realize how much of a difference that would make until I did it in practice. So my questions here are, what are the, the simple low hanging fruit practices that people can do who maybe live in an apartment, that can't go outside and stand naked in the grass in the morning sunlight first thing in the morning, as much as we'd all love to do that. And what are some tools and tactics that are good to utilize or effective for people who live in parts of the world where it gets very dark and very cold for prolonged periods of the year? One great way to start is instead of going out and standing in the grass in your apartment's lawn naked is go and take, uh, let's say you have a dog, go take your dog for a walk or just go for a walk as early in the morning as possible. If it's cold and you can acclimate to it or put on an extra jacket, then great. Um, you're going to get several benefits. If it's warm enough to wear, uh, you don't have to wear shoes and there's a place that is safe to walk, then that is also great. But uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. It doesn't have to be a walk. When I was in residency, I'd ride my longboard, which is like a easy to ride skateboard. I'd ride it to the hospital. And um, I, I felt like I was more in tune with my own thoughts when I could hear the birds waking up. I could see the squirrels running across the street. It was usually early in the morning or if it was a night shift, it was uh, late in the evening. And um, it, the wind is in your face. There is a lot of intangibles, but the things that are tangible from being outdoors is heat exposure, cold exposure, especially cold exposure in the morning. And then uh, um, the active exercise, often it can be a social thing as well. So whenever, for example, whenever I visit uh, Taylor Martin, um, he lives in Los Angeles and he lives in an apartment like most people in Los Angeles. And uh, there is very little natural light there we go on five or six walks a day. When I was in residency, I struggled to get outside other than with the long board. And one of the reasons why I did is because I noticed that my body composition was changing and not for the better. So I had to be very cognizant of that. And then over time that developed into a habit. And now I have a nickname of walking enthusiast. So, uh, and I like to walk outside as well. So even on most lunch hours, I do my very best to go for a walk and get some sun while I do that. 
I think you just got some major cool points for uh, riding a longboard to, to work when you were a resident. Um, I, I've often said to people back when I used to teach meditation that going for a walk without your headphones, I mean, I love going for a walk, you know, listening to a podcast or, you know, listening to an audio book, but I think there's a, there's a very magical part of the day first thing in the morning when you can get up early and go for a walk outside and you can hear all those sounds, you know, before the rest of the world's awake. And I think that that is something where I, I made this uh, a joke a while back that we're never going to get a randomized control interventional study where they take one group and put them on a you know morning walk in nature for an hour every day for you know two months and, and measure the outcomes on their mental health. We're never going to see that. But I think that that's something the sooner you do it, you know that yes, that's not going to maybe solve every single problem that you've had in the world, but it is going to make a difference towards moving you towards where you want to be from where you're at now. Um, and I, I also used to do something similar back when I used to work an office job. I used to go for just to walk around the block three times a day. Um, so lunch break, morning break, afternoon break, when people would go from there sitting at their computer desk to sitting at the you know break room, I would always make sure I kind of did like a loop of the block just to get more sunlight, get more movement, kind of get the body going. And I found that my productivity was massively, massively different, especially in the afternoon from, you know, 3 to 5 p.m. if I just went for, you know, a 10, 15 or even a 20-minute walk if I could get away with it. Um, so what would be the next uh, pillar that we can jump into here in the alliteration? We could talk about stress. There's a lot of tie-ins with that. So stress is not just your levels of epinephrine or norepinephrine, which are adrenaline and noradrenaline. It's not just your level of dopamine and how it relates to those. It's not just your cortisol or your rhythm of cortisol. It encompasses those things. But part of the reason why stress is a pillar of health is the self-fulfilling prophecy that can come when you are appropriately stressed to do a task, whether the task is work-related or family-related, and uh, you set an achievable goal and you achieve that um, somewhat subjective marker of success, that in and of itself is going to be a positive feedback loop. And what that means is basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's just, get, just gonna get better and better. And you're gonna be able to acclimate to more stress and do more stressful things. And um, when you succeed, that in and of itself often improves testosterone levels a little bit each time. and it also improves, um, it certainly gives you a dopaminergic hit without too much of a detriment to your dopaminergic tone. So in a much healthier way than a lot of ADHD meds improve dopaminergic tone, for example. So that's why stress is um, one of the major pillars of health. Uh, that is also with a caveat, um, do not overstress yourself. Uh, the dose makes the poison. There, there's, there's so much great stuff in there. When you were on the Human podcast, I also heard you, and I believe Andrew made the same comment, you gave the best uh, analogy of explaining how dopamine works in terms of a wave pool. Um, and I'll, I'll get you to run through that in a sec, because I, as someone who was, who's very into neuropsychiatry, very into how dopamine works, I think dopamine's a very hot topic on the, on the internet at the moment. And the way that you described uh, the wave pool of dopamine in terms of how uh, dopamine is made on demand and how receptor down regulation works was, you know, for anyone who was, a, I remember as a kid going to wave pools and they're so much fun and how you explain that was, you know, the perfect analogy. And, and what you're talking about there with stress is, is fantastic because when I look at stress, when, when I'm defining stress, I look at stress as the uh, not having enough X to do Y. So that can be, you know, doing something that is beyond your reach or it can be suffering from the stresses of not having enough money to pay the bills, intelligence to answer a question, not having enough you know, fuel in the tank to get to where you need to go. And I think as humans, we are built to overcome short bouts of intense stress. And I think that one of the most difficult things that we can have being what Carl Jung refers to as neurosis, which is where when we haven't been conditioned to stresses enough, everything can subjectively feel more stressful because we don't have enough of a baseline where things by contrast seem a little bit easier. And one thing I love with TRT is that TRT, when we increase testosterone, it, it tends to act as a bit of a biological buffer to the effects of stress in the body. And that can often allow, it, it doesn't make you get up and go do harder things, 
but when you go and do the things that are more difficult, like going to the gym, doing martial arts, you know, um, accomplishing something that was maybe a little bit out of your reach and, and that you overcame, I think that in that process, biologically, what happens is that it feels a bit better subjectively because less stress is going on. So can you go into this wave pool in terms of how dopamine works? Yeah, the dopamine wave pool is an analogy to explain how if you have too big of waves of dopamine, whether those are stimulated via exogenous means or via natural means, you are going to have the waves not only crash over the side, you're going to have such a big wave that you don't, that you have a bigger trough. So higher peak, lower trough, and the troughs, you're not going to pass that threshold to where your dopamine pool is at a point to where you feel dopaminergically happy and motivated. So another dysregulated state, you could make the case that um, most Cases of, cases of mania or bipolar disorder are just particularly high peaks and troughs in the dopamine wave pool. And there's certainly a lot of uh, waves crashing over the sides of the pool and impacting many other areas of life as well and other neurotransmitters. In cases of things like ADHD, a lot of times you just try to feel more dopamine, feel more dopamine, feel more dopamine, more focus, more motivation, even if it's exogenously. And um, in some cases, like let's say you're a high school senior and you're preparing for final exams or whatnot, or whatever the case may be, there's, there's certainly cases where use of medication is very beneficial in your life in the grand scheme of things. Otherwise, you might not be able to get past that barrier. But that's where the wave pool has the bottom of the pool drop. So then you're losing your dopamine sensitivity. So instead of having a 12 foot wave pool, you have a 25 foot wave pool and it's much harder to fill that pool without using exogenous means. Paul Conti has an interesting theory about um, dopamine and prolactin, but also specifically about testosterone, not necessarily about testosterone's effect, dopaminergic effect, but about its risk tolerance effect. Classically. Um, in neuroscience in general, you think of the dopamine to prolactin tug of war. And the lower your prolactin, in general, the higher your dopaminergic tone, because it's binding the D2 do dopaminergic receptor in the pituitary to stop the release of prolactin. But if you look at individuals that take very strong D2 receptor agonists, um, like Kaber or like bromocryptine, then their risk tolerance increases quite a bit. I'm not convinced that the risk tolerance threshold is going to change for someone that starts TRT. This is kind of back to the discussion about like what happens if you put monks on TRT? Uh, they become more monk-like, probably. But if somebody already has a relatively high risk threshold, they might attempt those that same risk threshold event, but something that requires slightly more effort. It's, it's, it's so much great stuff there. One of my one, one thing that you mentioned when you're talking about cabergoline and risk tolerance, if you if people jump on Reddit and go onto the steroid subreddit and look at people's experiences with cabergoline, you will find one of the most prevalent reoccurring stories is people fucking up their lives from gambling, um, which is you know that's it's definitely not something to laugh at, but in terms of the consistency that people had that occur with was very interesting with cabergoline being a very interesting D2 receptor, very specific in the way that it works agonist. My understanding of the way that, just to build on what you're saying with the, with the wave pools, is that testosterone in my research seems to increase this uh, concept of um, dopamine transmission. So rather than acting as, let's say, an agonist like uh, amphetamine or like a reuptake inhibitor like methylphenidate, we're looking at something which will, to use the wave pool analogy, increase the capacity of the pool and the size of the waves. So it allows more dopamine to come in and more dopamine to come out. And I think that that is something where people, when they start testosterone, they can often get a bit of a honeymoon period where now there's more water coming in before the pool gets bigger because the brain hasn't quite, you know, the brain was just sitting there blind and it didn't know that you were about to you know, three to four fold increase your testosterone out of nowhere. 
Um, have you seen the movie? I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get the name of the movie wrong, but it's the guy who free climbs El Capitan. I think it's called Free Climb. Have you, have you seen that movie on Netflix? Yeah, I think it's Alex Honnold. Yeah, yeah I, I right. found that fascinating when they go into the neuroscience at the end and they found that he had such little or virtually no cortisol binding uh, in his brain. And that was what allowed his prefrontal cortex to stay so active and functional while he was climbing. Um, and up until that point in the movie, I was like, this is one of the most mind blowing things I've ever seen. And then when you found out that his cortisol levels in his brain were bottomed out, all of a sudden it, it, it makes so much more sense. So if someone is sitting or sitting there, you know, listening today and, and maybe they're, they're looking at that wave pool analogy and they're going, my pool is, is empty. Maybe they used too much of the exogenous dopamine, um, agonists which you know made those waves too big or maybe they're sitting at a point where they're feeling a bit anhedonic um so they're not getting pleasure out of things they're finding that they're overwhelmed by the things in life that maybe they don't feel like they should be overwhelmed by and, and i like to call it um paralysis by analysis this overwhelm that prevents people from starting to build that momentum of those positive you know ticking off and and, over, and you know accomplishing things like you talked about getting the wins and moving forward I often recommend that people work on something difficult to improve their resilience and then also work on managing their stress responses. Would you make a similar recommendation or would you make recommendations that people could start elsewhere? And what do you think about that idea in general? Those are certainly good recommendations. Um, another thing to consider when someone's in that state is you know how far below the surface their dopamine wave pool is filled up to but you don't necessarily know the uh, consider it area under the curve. You don't know how much volume of dopamine is in the pool and you don't know how deep the pool is necessarily. You can estimate this mostly by getting uh, subjective info and looking at their history and what medications are they taking, et cetera. And if there is a way to um, temporarily give them a chance to improve the amount of dopamine that's in the pool and also its balance with serotonin if they're also very anxious about these things then you can consider things like genetic or you can consider supplements of note both uh, so every androgen and every estrogen so including testosterone and estradiol both um, are going to modulate monoamine oxidase i believe a and b so there's a lot of interactions with hormones and if you know whether it's thyroid hormone or androgen it's going to interact with almost every every cell and every organ system in the body but in the case of the individual that's trying to do something new and difficult to develop resilience and then also improve their stress response some people respond very well to things like mindfulness so they have different meditations where they're uh, doing body scans and they're they're basically uh it's kind of similar to what a lot of rock climbers do or a lot of free soloists do to where they're able to um, prevent the unnecessary fight or flight response that often comes with um, improved dopaminergic tone because dopamine is, uh, you know, a, an extremely close cousin to noradrenaline and adrenaline itself. They're both formed from tyrosine um, and they're both neurotransmitters and hormones. So thinking about what the specific goal is and basically where they're starting to get them to a place that is well regulated yeah fantastic i'm, I'm a big proponent of mindfulness as, as i've often talked about on this channel i actually have a lecture on mindfulness on here and one of the reasons and i, I want to lead this on to the, the next points regarding you know social interaction and purpose is that i think one of the the way that i always come back to mindfulness is there's this saying that i like call uh, rule your mind or it will rule you and I feel like that's what mindfulness is. It's being able to exert control and will over your mind. And the more mindful we can be in what we're doing and what we're achieving in day-to-day -day life, the more we can be connected in with that purpose and living that more purposeful existence rather than you know always regretting what we did in the past or wanting what we don't have in the future. That can allow us to just in that moment have a more dopaminergic tone in the brain because that is what is going to stimulate this release of dopamine and it, it's fantastic you brought up this the connection between hormones and uh monamine oxidase also you know uh comped um other uh enzymes that metabolize neurotransmitters and it's actually what got me into hormones was realizing that the hormones are 
some of the most powerful modulators outside of things like inflammation, exercise, diet for uh, regulating neurotransmission in the brain, which is you know going to impact subjectively how we experience uh, life. So I believe the last two pillars to go through, um, unless I've, I've skipped one out, um, is the social interaction and then the spiritual uh, fulfillment. Is that correct? Correct. So with the social, as I mentioned previously, um, it wasn't an initial pillar. So initially there was just six pillars. But uh, I did a podcast with Rich Roll and we talked a lot about social health. We talked about, um, you know, what we're doing as a family. It's well known uh, in things like nicotine cessation or alcohol cessation that um, you do it as a family or it does not work particularly well in obesity medicine, which is one of my main backgrounds. It's also well known, but it can be applied to pretty much anything. So regardless of what you're going through, you essentially go through it as a family unit. Um, and uh, this includes close friends as well. So even if you have a couple of roommates, you're uh, likely going through very similar things with them for better or for worse. And the uh, recent pandemic in a couple of years has shown us how important social health is, because if you look at uh, markers like metabolic health, um, and how much people are exercising, how much people are spending time with each other now, it is significantly worse than three or four years ago. So that's social health. Um, when it comes to spiritual health, we also kind of chatted about that briefly, um, talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, talked about how uh, a nihilist, which is like the hyper extreme example of uh, sometimes people say, you know, it's great that you have a spiritual health as a pyramid, but, you know, I'm a, um, you know, a very solid nihilist and um i don't need spiritual health so that's kind of how i see it it does not have anything to do with religion or legalism it just has to do with what your purpose is here on this earth i, I love that the purpose is, is sitting at the top when i when i went through the czech institute one thing that really stood out at me that the poll said was he said one of the key determining factors whether someone is going to get through what they're getting through and he also said that at some point in time, your health is going to be your ultimate priority. And I think that that's also very true. But he said that one of the main determining factors as to whether someone will get better is if they have a purpose for getting better. And I find that a lot of the time when I talk to clients about that, they say, you know, I, I want to get better. I want to feel better. And when I say, well, why do you want to feel better? And they say, because I want to feel better. And I think that if, if that's all that people have to get through doing the difficult things, either stopping doing the vices or you know putting the work into the things that have some resistance, I really don't think that that is enough in practice for people to push and commit and be consistent to do the things that maybe they need to do and, and don't want to do. Um, and I, I think the the social point, as you said, you know during the pandemic that really highlighted that, I know that when I look back in, in my life, one of the happiest times I had as, as an early child, was when I was playing music. I was I was in a band with with four other guys, and and that gave me four brothers. Um, it, it caused a lot of drama, but it was also it was amazing to have four people who were also you know we were at, at the time the, the purpose was playing music, um, and we were doing that together and growing and practicing and, and and performing together. And I think looking back, the a big part of what made that so satisfying and enjoyable was uh, the the camaraderie and the connection with other people. And I would say that that's also something that people probably get from playing sports um, and also having a good relationship with their family. So if someone is in a situation where, you know, they, they're feeling isolated, they don't play team sports, you know, maybe they're a little bit introverted. Um, what do you think are, are things that people can do to facilitate that further? And what are things that people can um, actually, no, I, I think that summarizes the question. You know, what What is something that people could get started on with that if they maybe are feeling a bit isolated and, and don't know where to begin? It could be almost anything. For example, I had a very good friend. Um, we were roommates all through medical school. We went to residency together. We're still very good friends. Um, and he and I shared a love of listening to the Drive podcast with Peter Atia. Um, so we both really enjoyed that and we still do. And we enjoy talking about health optimization. Um, we, yeah, I guess I'm trying to convince him to do podcasts because I know he has extremely similar interests from me and has for more than a decade. But uh, even though he liked rock climbing and I loved volleyball and basketball, 
Um, we still shared over that mutual interest, even though it was not a sport. So it can be almost anything. Um, it can be the love of nature, the love of gardening. So I met some friends that way as well. Um, so my wife's family is huge conservationist, and I consider myself um, a rabid conservationist as well, but like probably not exactly how you're thinking of them. Um, so we have bonded over that. Yeah, I think that's fantastic to find things to bond over. And, you know, one thing I did when I moved here to, you know, a different country where I didn't speak the language is I went and found group activities where I could meet people. And it wasn't just to meet people, but that was definitely a factor was to have a degree of community, um, especially going, you know, through the pandemic was finding a community. And I think, you know, for me, it was finding a Muay Thai gym. Um, I, I think that, you know, exercise classes, yoga classes, what a great way to have, have two birds with one stone. And I often say for people who are looking to make connections, one of the best things you can do is going to a beginner's exercise class, whether it's you know martial arts or, or yoga or something like that, because not only are you going to meet people with similar interests, but you're also meeting people who in their spare time are going out of their way to work on self-development. And I think that they're often people who, if you're wanting to work on yourself, it's good to have people around who are doing that together, similar to what you said before about you know things like quitting nicotine and alcohol have to be done as a family unit. And I think having other people on the same path is extremely beneficial so the last thing that you you spoke about was was purpose um and it, it's a big one as i said before that I, I speak to all my clients about um personally my when i look at purpose and when people ask me for mine i say that my purpose is to uh leave the world a better place than i found it and make the world a better place because i was in it and i think that for, for people who are struggling to find their purpose i say well your purpose is to find your purpose and that can take time so my, my question for you, just as something that we can we can lead off on, is uh, wh what is your purpose? Yeah, um, my purpose is a kind of a, a couple different facets. One of them is to be a good family member and a good friend to my uh, close family and my close friends. One of the most important things to me is quality time. So spending time with them in person when possible is quite important to me. Another important part of my purpose is to be uh, unashamed with what I do. So whether that's being considered as part of the functional medicine community, there's obviously a negative connotation to that. Whether it's being considered a hormone doctor, there's a negative connotation to that. Whether it's a telemedicine doctor, of course, I don't do just telemedicine, but I do a lot of telemedicine. There's a negative connotation to that. Whether it's being a Christian, uh, being a Christian and a scientist and clinician, um, there's definitely a negative connotation to that but I do my best to explain uh, my reasonings behind certain things and to do so, so unashamedly. Um, that being said, there is definitely times when it's a, a little bit awkward uh, coming from a background like that. At the end of the day, I'm just uh, kind of a typical Kansan. So, you know, grew up around animals and I was homeschooled and uh, been a Christian essentially my whole life. And I have two kids, I have a wife. Um, I'm probably what you picture as a relatively typical Kansan, but part of my purpose is to get out of my shell and, um, you know, travel around, do podcasts, talk about my opinions and hopefully help other people along the way. I think that's a, that's a fantastic point to be at. And I think that, you know, just to, just to make a couple of uh, closing comments and then get a, a kind of surmising uh, statement from, from you before we wrap up. I think that focusing on things like that in terms of what's going on in your mind's eye, I mean, I'm sure that there are things that, you know, you're working on and there are things about yourself that you're improving and there are things about yourself that maybe you don't see as 100%. But if what you're fixating and focusing on in your mind's eye is that I'm showing up in the world and I'm doing this for these reasons, I think that's such an important thing to fixate on because that's what's going to determine your experience in terms of the, the story that you're writing and the life that you're living. So. The, the thing I love about this conversation and this whole topic is that I feel like, as, as I said at the start, these are things which so many guys will look over, they'll, they'll neglect in favor of looking for a short term solution. You know, the anxiety and isolate the anxiety that might come from isolation can be mediated with a benzodiazepine rather than growing your community, for example. The, uh, the low dopamine can be improved with you know, some tyrosine and some you know, other nootropics daily and a nootropic stack and some extra caffeine rather than, you know, working on things to improve that dopaminergic tone. So as kind of like an overarching, I guess, going back to that functional medicine statement, I'm trying to work out how to put this. 
what, what do you think that that as a key take home from these you know now seven pillars of health what do you think the key take home is for guys who are maybe sitting down and that they're, they're, they're trying to get themselves you know dialed in and optimized and they're kind of myopically looking at their dose or their protocol or certain aspects of your blood work what do you think the key overarching kind of takeaway from this is that if there's kind of one thing that they need to remember from today's talk that they need to uh, embody and understand yes we are organic machines and yes we can take care of ourselves just like we would take care of both the car and the driver if both were combined but at the end of the day there's a lot more to that um, you can have an optimally functioning organic machine at least in theory the numbers look good but when it comes to your purpose think of that as your game in life no we shouldn't look at ourselves as the main character or in a, a egotistical way or a narcissist way but we also shouldn't look at ourselves as NPCs. Life is a game and there's a lot more ways to play it than most people are playing it. That's one thing I could probably say about myself is, yes, I have certainly played the game in my relatively short time here. So instead of sitting on the sidelines or instead of occasionally playing the game, not only play, but play it hard how you want to play it. I think that's awesome. I love that idea of, of, of playing it hard and how you want to play it. I think that that's such a, I think that's such an empowering thing for people to hear. Um, so thank you, Carl, for your time. Um, thank you for sharing with us. And uh, for people who want to work with you or, or find out more about you or find other resources that you've put online, uh, where's the best place for them to find you? My Instagram is Kyle Gillette, MD, Gillette Health on all other platforms and GilletteHealth.com. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Kyle Gillette, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. My pleasure.